Okay, I'm, two minutes I'm going to spend on the uh, first topic, and it's a privilege to be here with uh, these other uh, distinguished panelists. Um, decades ago, I had the privilege of doing my graduate work at Stanford, which, as you know, is right next door to Silicon Valley. In fact, Silicon Valley grew up there, but I learned yesterday uh, that BK had done his uh, graduate work at Caltech, uh, a few hundred miles south, I think. But uh, at any rate, I've been interested in uh, the digital information revolution and the kind of technology that, that has interested me and many others has been presented in many of the sessions at this conference. It's uh, information and communication technology, which economists refer to as a general purpose technology because of its sweeping effects on societies, economies, culture, all over the world. Um, this session, we're going to talk a little bit about technical trends and also maybe ethical issues. In terms of technology, uh, I just read yesterday and did a, a blog post, as a matter of fact, on my own blog on the new VNAND memory chip that Samsung Electronics has just unveiled. Uh, this is a first step toward a terabyte sized uh, three-dimensional layered NAND memory. And given that semiconductors are the building blocks of a lot of what's going on with the information revolution, I think this is uh, important. Uh, as far as ethical issues, I just want to mention uh, something that you're all aware of. Uh, President Obama recently announced a 10-year project to map the human brain. And from what I've been reading about that, this is fascinating because we don't even have the measurement tools yet. It's a 10-year project. It's very ambitious, sort of like the moon landing when John Kennedy, President Kennedy, uh, announced that. But it does raise a number of ethical issues. One, for example, if you can map the human brain, can you copy and then replicate it? And what does that mean ethically? So I'm going to turn it over now to BK. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I spent all my life in the nuclear power engineering, about 40-some years. And nuclear power today in Korea we find ourselves in a mixture of what I call national pride as well as national shame. Uh, national pride comes from the technology we developed, mainly from this TEDx science town over the last 30 some years. And also the other side of the coin is national shame comes from the ethical issue which we find ourselves today in the newspaper every day. So let me give you just a few keywords. The, the, the national pride, the Korea, South Korea today, is number four in the world in terms of nuclear electricity generation. Only after number one, US, number two, France, number three, Russia, and if you can believe it, number four is Korea. Used to be Japan, but after Fukushima, they shy, shy them away. Yeah. And through the last 30 years, the localization of technology in terms of building up the nuclear industry, supply chain, Korea was very, very successful. And now they deliver about 40% of the electricity, the cheapest and cleanest and very, very reliable. Okay, and they were even able to export the nuclear power plant. All right, two hundred million dollar project to the billion dollar project, twenty billion, I'm sorry, twenty billion dollar project to UAE. So this is all the positive, pride, proud side of the story. Now the negative side, the shame side, was very recently revealed over the scandal, over the mischiefs that, that the, the local industry and local big corporations were able to handle in terms of forging the documents, in terms of bribing the officials to, to gain 
monetary gains. And uh, this resulted in uh, actually the forcing down, the shutdown of three nuclear power plants today, so that we are facing serious shortage of electricity this summer during this high air conditioning peak season. So, only good news, uh, I find myself, is that actually this all mischiefs did not result in any, any of actual accidents in the nuclear power plants. All right, so far. So, what do we do about it? And I hope I give you some clue, keywords, to think about and come back with some good questions. All right, enough? Thank you, BK. Gary? Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm, now, I'm a lawyer and I work at the interface of science and law and I'm particularly interested in forensic science. Um, and the forensic sciences, I guess, are the application of uh, technical capabilities and scientific knowledges to legal settings, particularly for the prevention, the detection and the prosecution of crime, of criminal acts. Um, unfortunately, to some extent, these things um, are not like it appears in CSI, to the extent that you know about those. Um, one clue might be that I'd, been, I'd look more like Tyler, I guess, if it, if it was like CSI, but it's not like that. And that's, un that's unfortunate for all of us, I guess. Um, and that's just a kind of foreboding of the main problems with the forensic sciences. One is um, probably the main problem with the forensic sciences that has emerged in recent years is that we've found that for many of the techniques, and here I'm talking about things that are used routinely, like fingerprinting, like voice comparison, like the interpretation of images, uh, voice, uh, bite marks, uh, footprints, document comparison, is that most of these techniques have never been researched, so we don't know whether the analysts can do what they claim in courts, um, nor whether they're very accurate when they do it. This is a real problem. Um, another problem that's emerged is that the kinds of terminologies they use to report in courts in, or in their reports for other kinds of legal settings is that they're using terms which, again, aren't empirically predicated. So that means that they're speculating or using intuition a lot of the times because we don't know, again, whether they can do what they claim, so we don't know if, whether their claims are founded. Um, and this is a problem for lay people in the courts, whether they're judges or lawyers or juries in some jurisdictions, for being able to understand the evidence that's being brought in to prosecute people. Another problem is that the legal system, and legal systems all around the world, not just my own, or, or the US or Germany, but also Korea, I imagine, and they're not aware of these problems um, or deficiencies in the forensic sciences. And indeed, there's a big disjuncture in between what's known beyond the courts and what's not known beyond the courts and the kinds of methods and values that they have in the sciences and in various practices beyond the courts and what goes on inside the courts. So that's a problem. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit about solutions, but in terms of some of the solutions, obvious things might be more research, um, better training for lawyers, judges and experts. A lot of the expert witnesses aren't actually formally scientifically qualified, so that's a problem. Um, more transparency in the kinds of things that experts do and in their reporting, describing limitations and threats and risks in their practices. And probably the most important thing, and I'll end on this, is there's a need, I think, to think here, and I'm particularly interested in legal settings, but we're going to talk beyond legal settings into IT, telecommunications, media and nuclear power. Um, the kinds of images or definitions of science that I might want to apply to expert evidence in legal settings where there's a real risk that the liberty of individuals might be taken away when they're imprisoned. So I'm, I'm suggesting we should have quite high reliability standards for expert evidence. Um, might not be the kinds of standards that you would have in place or models of science in other places. So the context, the culture and the expectations of the particular venue or the yeah, context in which these things are being applied matters, and we need to, need to think about those in terms of our understanding of science, the use of science. Thank you. And finally, Chester. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I've got a little bit of overlap with Jim in my knowledge and expertise, and that we both work within the computer field and communications, but obviously my focus is more specific uh, on security issues. And so I kind of want to branch off from Jim's introduction 
a little bit where he talked about the, the NAND memory, for example, this ability to have amazing capacity. And, and on the bright side of things, uh, echoing BK's of, approach to this, of we've got some good and we've got some bad, right? On the bright side, the developments in uh, you know technology, both at the at the chip level and in fiber optics and in communications across the board, is doing some really amazing things. And it reminds me a bit of Professor Christian's talk yesterday morning uh, on Big History, talking about our ability to communicate knowledge and store vast quantities of knowledge and spread that knowledge very fast uh, for uh, whatever purposes we wish. And working in computer security is a real uh, challenge right now globally in that we've only got about 5% as many trained professionals in this business as there's actually demand for in the field. Every government is looking for experts to help defend their national sovereignty and their national secrets online. Every corporation is trying to defend not just their websites but protect their intellectual property, their employees and their customers. There's not nearly enough trained professionals so this this ability to store so much data and transmit it so quickly uh, has been a great boon to getting people trained very quickly and bringing them up to speed in, in this very fast changing uh, uh, technology market. But on the other side of it, what concerns me ethically about where we're going generally with technology and on the internet with regard to security is an entire lack of transparency. Uh, what made the internet successful when it was developed in the 1970s and then widely adopted in the 1990s was the openness. Everybody could peel back the covers and see exactly what was going on inside and every bit of it was understood and explainable to everyone. And once it's gone mainstream over the last 20 years, we're losing that transparency. It's becoming more and more controlled by a smaller and smaller number of companies. Uh, you no longer can understand what's being done with your information, where it's going, who has it, what, you know, what they might be doing with it and maybe not even understand uh, you know, how that uh, is being stored. And when we consider that we can put a chip potentially in our pocket that Samsung's making that holds a terabyte of information in our pocket and we don't know who's collecting all that information and what they're doing with it, uh, I think that's a real risk uh, to the, the trust that we have in these technologies and our abilities uh, uh, to, to freely and openly communicate without others having control. Well, thank you. I, th I think you, uh, you all get a sense of the breadth of uh, possibilities in, in today's discussion. And uh, my duty as a moderator is I'm going to uh, open up with the panel here in the next few minutes uh, a discussion where we can delve a little bit further into some of the points that have been raised. But then we'll, we're going to be sure to allow plenty of time for questions from this um, audience. Because you're all cool now, you're air conditioned uh, after hiking over from lunch or, or wherever. And uh, so we're in a comfortable location. So uh, consider what your questions are, make a memo, make a mental note, whatever, and be ready for those because we're gonna plan to, uh, it's 10 to two according to my calculation and we're going to plan to allow plenty of time for uh, Q&A. Um, I'll take just a second to, uh, or a minute to um, elaborate a bit on uh, my idea because I, I was sparked by some, some things that Chester just uh, said. In terms of uh, the technological developments that are fueling the, what is variously termed uh, the uh, growth of the networked information economy, or as Manuel Castells calls it, the rise of the network society, or many people just say the in information society, or the Chongo Sahai, Chongo Tongjin Sahai, you know. Uh, actually, Korea has reacted to these changing realities because it's got the Mirei Changcho Kwahaku, which uh, doesn't translate into English, but it's the new super ministry under President Park Geun-hye. It's called the Ministry for ICT, Science, ICT, and Future Planning. A very ambitious uh, effort on the part of the uh, Korean government. But it's a response to trends like the explosive growth of data, 
the rapid spread of mobile communication, 96% of the world's population now has a mobile phone. And the rise of smartphones, the smartphones are taking off at a pace where within a very few years, everybody's gonna have a smartphone with huge uh, memory capacity. So the question becomes, and along with this, you've got the appearance of citizen journalism, open innovation, the massive open online courseware efforts like Udacity, edX, Coursera, and others. You can take courses now free of charge online, uh, that, wherever you are in the world. And uh, this raises uh, questions. In my presentation, I got a good question at the end from one of the students. The question was, if we view media and television as a sort of a window on the world, and I had talked about how we human beings still cannot perceive the whole world, even in the 21st century, despite all these new information. We can perceive only what we can pay attention to and comprehend. So the media still serve as a kind of a window shaping our view of the world. And this student had asked me, well, how can you tell if the window is clear, transparent, or if it's uh, red or sort of opaque or another color? Excellent question. How are we, and I'll just throw it into the mix, how are we going to be able to, um, in this new information environment that's coming so quickly with so much information overload, how are we going to be able to determine which sources are trustworthy? I mean, Jeff Bezos just purchased the Washington Post newspaper yesterday. Jeff Bezos is the founder of Amazon.com. So, I, this is all heading fast in a certain future direction, and I, I have a question, BK, for you based on your comments. I've wondered, and maybe some of our audience and others here have too, about the future of uh, nuclear energy. Does it have a long-term future, or is it an interim step toward a future where we may rely on solar, wind, other environmentally friendly? Excellent, excellent question, Jim. Of course, every new technology has risks and benefits, and nuclear power is no exception, in that we produce huge, huge amount of electricity energy. However, it has negative side of accidents and radiation release and so on. So it's not a perfect solution to the energy needs. So what I would say, is it's an interim solution for the next decades to come until, until the alternative technology become as competitive, as clean, yeah, as economic, and a huge, large scale. So solar and wind energy, create a huge momentum and expectation almost half century ago. But still, today, solar and wind energy, which is considered the number one in, 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 in the renewable energy sector, has not really crossed the barrier to, to become uh, competitive in, in economically as well as, as uh, environmentally. So. Nuclear is an interim solution until the, uh, until the uh, uh, real renewable alternative energy becomes as massive, as economic, as competitive. Yeah, on a huge, huge scale, national, international scale, not local scale. So let's wait and see. Maybe in your generation it will be possible. In my generation, <coughs> probably not. A quick follow-up uh, on a very specific, a short question, BK, and then uh, please chime in, fellow panel members, but the Fukushima situation, my understanding as a layperson in this is that they are spraying water on these plants to keep their, the reactor cores cool, and they're accumulating massive amounts of uh, contaminated water. 
how are they going to solve this problem? Because at some point they'll be una unable to store all the water and it'll have to spill into the groundwater or into the ocean or something. Yeah, Fukushima happened about two and a half years ago, you all remember, 2011, March 11th day. Uh, and still today, Japanese are struggling to cope with the spread of this huge amount of radiation. And the biggest headache is this water uh, pollution from the ocean and whatever spills over from the reactor core. Uh, it will be done, <coughs> uh, nature takes its course, its own course, in a way that the level of radiation decays, what, what's called, known as a half-life, yeah? depending on the radionuclide. Some are very short, some are very long, but the very a massive amount of radiation is relatively short half-life. So next 10, at least 20 years, you will see this natu natural course of events will decay. But also uh, man-made, eh? the, the technical people in, in Japan will, will do their best to, to decommission, the clean up the mess, and reduce the radiation uh, waste level, and, and take it away from the biosphere, to, to, to shrink it and to bury it under the ground. So, so it will take time, unfortunately, but uh, nature is helping, and also the, man, uh, the human technology. Gary? Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question in relation to the nuclear issue because I think it, it um, brings out the issue you were talking about in relation to trust and I guess knowledge and ignorance. If you think back to some of the debates historically about um, reliance upon nuclear power, I think it's, it's probably salient to think now, reflect now on whether things like for in the Japanese context there's a lot of disclosure in relation to public access to information about the implications of these things being built on faults, or whether in the South Korean context there was thought, even given to the possibility that um, you know, parts might be substituted, that was a risk, whether that was a risk that was ever contemplated, in a sense, these problems of trust and what you can know aren't just kind of coming out of the emergence of new types of media, but they've always um, existed, how much we could know, whether we could trust the people that gave us information in relation to things, but also how blind we were by relying upon certain sources in relation to the risks that did or might kind of expose themselves. Yeah, good point, Gary. In fact, the Japanese and Koreans share the common uh, mentality or, or the, the, the Confucius uh, culture background that we do have a handicap in terms of trans transparent in, in, in sharing information in the critical condition, like uh, Fukushima, like the current uh, Korean situation today. Uh, because the Orientals in general tends to think of their face saving is far more important than uh, actual uh, sharing data and be, be, be open to the public, uh, to the extent as the Americans did after the TMI accident, and what the Europeans have done after the, after the Chernobyl accident. So, so we still have to overcome this uh, cultural barrier as well. Yeah, Japanese, and then between Japan and Korea and China, these are three uh, big, big three uh, in, the, in the Far East, also have a delicate uh, sense of being not so transparent to each other because, because of our historical reasons or the, uh, territorial issues and many other issues. So we do have a lot to learn from, from the Western uh, example of handling this major, major crisis. Uh, Gary, I'd like to ask you to also take a look toward the future. You mentioned a few things in your opening comments, but um, because your area of interest deals with law, and because, the, as you mentioned, you know, the legal systems all around the world are in the process of uh, adjusting to a new reality, but um, to, to what extent do future remedies to some of the issues that you brought up involve global cooperation as opposed to independent action by individual nations? 
Um, I think we'll see in the ne next couple of decades a lot of global co cooperation in relation to um, forensic sciences. They already exist in terms of law enforcement, so we have Interpol, we have a lot of collaboration between, say, the FBI, CIA, and various kind of investigative police agencies all around the world. Um, so we have protocols in place and we have practical agreements, but that hasn't extended to undertaking research to support the forensic sciences themselves. And so I think there's no doubt that will occur. Um, and that would be positive because most of these jurisdictions around the world are using similar sorts of technology, so they may as well actually undertake the basic research um, in conjunction. So, so we'll see a lot of that, and that'll be a positive development. Okay. Uh, let me toss the same basic question, Chester, on to you uh, in, the, in the area of uh, cybersecurity, generally. Uh, how much, uh, what do you see developing over the next five to ten years or more in terms of uh, global quality? What's going on now and, and what would happen? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of loaded question. There's a lot of uh, detail in there. I mean, uh, these, while these organizations that Gary mentions ex exist, things like Interpol is one of the more traditional ways of trying to get international cooperation for prosecution when we're talking about uh, criminal oriented cybercrime, which is the vast majority of stuff for folks that um, weren't in my session yesterday. If you look at global computer crime, probably 99% of it or, or more is uh, oriented financially and has nothing to do with cyber war or nation states or secrets or intellectual property or any of that. It's identity theft and credit card fraud and you know this type of thing that we see day-to-day uh, -day online with malware and online gaming accounts and this type of stuff. And prosecuting that so far has been uh, a pretty massive failure. I mean, there's been very little success in law enforcement at uh, international cooperation, and nearly every case has an international component. And one of the biggest issues there is speed. Um, you know, the internet moves very, very fast, and law enforcement and the courts move very, very slow. Uh, the, the few cases I've been involved in, on average, it's about eight years from the time at which we uh, hand something to law enforcement until there's actually a prosecution and a trial on the rare occasion that there's ever a trial. So it would appear that um, there's going to be a lot of political movement on this issue in coming years as we recognize that uh, the variances we have in laws around the world and the lack of cooperation is really starting to have a major economic negative impact in a lot of economies because of the amount of crime that's happening. Um, I, I was talking to, uh, maybe I should not name the specific police force, let's just say a Canadian police agency, um, who said they very specifically politically don't count cybercrime in their theft numbers. And so they're telling people that uh, financial crimes in Canada are down 70 some percent, when in reality, if you count internet crime, it's up 20 percent. Um, but they've intentionally chosen not to count internet crime because they don't know what to do about it. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of this head in the sand type of stuff going on in a lot of agencies around the world. And uh, what has been strangely happening is uh, trade agreements seem to be having the biggest impact right now. I've seen the, the United States getting leverage with a lot of former Soviet republics in prosecutions ahead of important trade negotiations. So it seems to be maybe uh, the first world and the third world are working a little more closely together now to say, you know, work together on things when there's a, a mutual benefit or a mutual economic interest in doing so. Yeah. You know, one of my, uh, one of the themes that sort of cuts through uh, that all four of us have touched on is uh, trust, credibility, uh, accountability. In, in my presentation earlier, and in, actually in a number of other presentations at this conference, people have addressed this issue of you've got an explosion in the number of sources of, let's say, video information with everybody carrying a uh, really high quality video device. I happen to have a Galaxy 3, but whether you've got an iPhone or a Galaxy 4, or one of the new Moto X's now, which are coming out, being manufactured in the United States by Google. Um, you know, uh, you've got a camera there, so you've got a, an explosion in the number of sources, an explosive increase in the amount of available information. 
which poses a problem for individual students, for individual citizens, anywhere in the world. Problem being, how do I know uh, which information to trust? Because, as we discussed, you can take a photograph and plug it into photo, uh, uh, Photoshop. You can Photoshop a photograph. You can take a video and doctor it quite easily with digital uh, information these days. So, but it seems to me that, um, and I'll throw this out for any observations here, that uh, crowdsourcing, which has been used in uh, science, uh, it's been used in fundraising, uh, it's also, uh, I think, uh, potentially very useful in uh, sort of fact-checking. Uh, and there might, there might be a box office business uh, arising in that, in the new information uh, environment. What, any thoughts? Or questions? Well, yeah. I think there's another piece of that as well, which is that the internet doesn't forget. Everything is being recorded as well. There's, there's kind of two angles. It's what is truth? what can be trusted, what hasn't been manipulated when it's digital. And then, and, and that kind of ties into a lot of the forensics, which is where some of the challenges in your business are coming up, right? Like, bits can be manipulated and it's very difficult to, to certify that a bit hasn't changed. Um, and then the other side of that is that we all make mistakes and we can't seem to get away from them anymore. And it would be nice if, uh, you know, we, we had a little digital forgetfulness and, and it doesn't seem to exist anymore. I know I made a lot of mistakes that hopefully no one has any evidence to provide today. Yes. Uh, in my life that I wouldn't want dug back up, but folks your age um, have a much more difficult time with that growing up with everything being recorded everywhere. Okay, now we have you as a captive audience, but you also have us. So are there questions? Raise your hand if you have a question to pose. Okay, we got one uh, here, because we, we've got 20 minutes to go, but I, I thought it would be good to... Okay, can someone give him a mic so that he can be heard by everyone? And are there other questions? This is your chance. Okay, microphone? Wait. Uh, excuse me, do we have... Uh, there should be here, here people with coming. microphones coming. Down here in the front, uh, the gentleman has a, a question. So these are long enough, we could. Uh, no. Yeah, we could walk out into the audience, but it, then we reach the end of the corridor. Okay. Now, others in the audience, put your, your thinking caps on and uh, be ready to roll with questions, because we'll, we'll probably continue through the end with an interchange. May I stop? Yeah. Please do. Yeah. Oh. You told about the speed of these societies. Please introduce yourself yeah, at the beginning, if you would. Yeah. My name is Jin Huang Yi from Gyeongbuk University. And uh, is it enough to introduce myself? Uh, then you told about the modern society speed increasing, very changing very fast. So we. We cannot respond, respond quickly. So that means how to prevent irreversible situation from happening, such as nuclear spill in Fukushima, and such as identical information theft like that. Is it proper question? <laughs> Me or you? I, I, I was because I was thinking, you know. Also, do you want because one? Do you oh, want Gary? Oh, that's especially, especially low part. <coughs> yeah, low. Uh, some kind of judgment uh, is concluded very lately, such as if this situation happened ten years ago and then it concluded thirty years later. Long way to go to conclude that situation. Long negotiation. Long something. That's just bad, I think, and so but I'll come back to that if you want to, and I'll say something preliminary about your first question. I mean, I think if you, we have to go back to this kind of, the political question around, um, you know, 
we have to try and ascertain what some of the risks with some of these new technologies, whether it's GM, whether it's um, nuclear power, um, whether it's uh, whether it's the use of new technologies in the courtrooms. Different different contexts um, will have different implications about what happens. So it may well be that, and as I say, these are political questions. The society sees the kind of economic value or other forms of social value in allowing new technologies to emerge. It may well be that media and communication technologies are seen as very valuable and they want those to kind of open up and liberate society or facilitate commerce or whatever. So there can be risks and downsides. But in context, and I focus mainly on the criminal justice system at the moment, um, I think you want to be wary about allowing speculative technologies in to put people in prison. You want to know much more about them. Um, and if you think about another context that might be, say, climate change and global warming, um, or the regulation in relation to the environment, in those contexts, you wouldn't want to have to have definitive um, knowledge before you intervene or maybe acted in a prudent or precautionary way. It may well be that there's just some kind of low-level risks that you want to act on because of the irreversibility or the danger. And again, these aren't questions that are specifically able to be answered by scientists, although scientists and, tech and people involved in technology will have input. They're political and social issues that we need to think about in terms of our society. Uh, I have a question for you kind of related to that, looking at the area of law I'm most familiar with, which is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act in the United States, which I believe was originally passed in like 1986. And it's a pattern of laws that I've seen relating to technology by people that don't understand technology very well, the US Congress in this case. And, but it was very prescriptive and took power away from the courts and the experts and said, if you do thing X, of which we don't really know what that means because we're old lawmakers and we've never had a computer, but we're gonna pass a law about this. If you do thing X, you're going to go to prison for 10 years. And there's no ability for a judge to look at it in context and understand. I think um, many of you may have heard of the, the case in the United States a, uh, a year ago of a, a man named Matthew Schwartz who took his own life, uh, was being prosecuted by the federal government for some, some data theft at which the people who he took the data from had forgiven and didn't want to prosecute even. But these types of things, I mean, is that a danger when we're looking into, you know, legislating future technology that either we don't understand currently or simply being too prescriptive about things that we don't know where it's going. I think yeah, for sure. Um, and maybe one of the things that we should be thinking about with our technologies is whether we can transform the, our ability to um, make laws um, so that they're kind of able to be made, incorporating more participation and maybe able to be adapted more quickly. The trouble is though, we probably don't want more law and this has been one of the problems over the last say two decades in most jurisdictions is that the number of laws that have ma are made, that the amount of regulation that goes on in society has in some cases doubled, tripled or quadrupled. Um, and that's undesirable as well. There's no doubt that law in many, many areas is both arcane and um, dr dramatically lagging, and that's undesirable just as it's undesirable sometimes to be at the avant-garde. Um, and once things are embedded, it's like many technologies, you're on a trajectory and it's very hard to change those. And um, I'm not exactly sure what to do about that, so I don't have a clear answer. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, we've got a couple of hands. There's one in, stand up if you have a question, please. <laughs> stand up so that, that we can get a mic to you. Okay. And then there's another, is there a second mic? Thank There's you. another person. After after your question, we'll take your question up there. Okay. This is Sun Shu Xiao from China, and I have a question for Professor Edma. Um, what do you think uh, of the relationship with uh, new technology and the policy and laws? Um, should we wait till the policy is mature enough to um, for this technology and? then put this technology into practice or should we put a uh, new technology into practice first and uh, wait to see the progress and then have a new policy or law to relate it to this technology? Thank you. Thanks. That's a good question. I think um, just the way the world works with various jurisdictions, with various economies that are kind of separate and integrated, um, 
you know, the code, if, if one society kind of stops and regulates, another society will be permissive and allow it, and it'll be seen that one will have an advantage over another. It's very difficult to do that. And law struggles to, um, to keep up with so many of these things. And that it's the issues that tend to be politicised, where large corporate interests are involved, and they influence, I guess, legislatures and politicians where these things happen. I guess the main problem for us as citizens, as individuals or small collectives, is to get access to trustworthy information. This comes back to Jim's point, And to have viable ways of participating in the debates. That's what we should be looking for. And I guess as young, um, highly educated and articulate kind of world and national citizens, you should be looking to participate and advise and assist in some of these processes. You have to have an polit active political life, otherwise these things will just happen above our heads or we won't know about them. And most citizens find it very difficult to partic participate. Okay, uh, way up at the back. Now, anyone else with a question, raise your hand and we'll get the mic. Okay, you'll be next then, up there. Okay. Go ahead with your question, please. Hi, uh, thank you for your discussions. Mm -hmm. um, you stand up? Yeah. If you stand with your question and identify yourself first, briefly. My name is Hanuk Ko, I'm, and, I'm an, I'm, and I'm an undergrad student at Cal, um, in California. And uh, my question is regarding cybercrime and when, in terms of addressing the accountability issue. I was wondering the extent to which, it is, if it is possible at all, to create a global partnership in which we can address uh, accountability, accountability issue and how we can accuse individual crimes, and if it is possible, the extent to which that is possible, and if it's possible for different nations to form sort of, a, sort of an agency that can regulate those kinds of individual crimes occurring over the world. And, and by accountability, do you mean attribution, the proof of who's behind a given thing so they can be prosecuted? Or? Yes, and if it's, if it's possible at all for an international organization or an agency to to right. punish those individuals. Yeah, there's a kind of, I think it's, you have to split the crime into two separate pieces to answer the question in that when you're talking about things that um, might be considered nation state, um, I don't think one, that you'll ever be able to prove anything enough to be able to actually publicly accuse another nation. And I don't think you'll ever get any cooperation. Uh, for example, the Russian government has been pushing for the UN to pass kind of some um, uh, ground rules for cyber war, if you will, and the Americans will have none of it. And as long as those two don't, you know, can't even agree that the sky, uh, that the sun rises in the east, um, that is never going to happen. Um, on the other side, when we're talking about everyday criminal stuff, you've hacked into my server and you're in a different country than I am, that type of thing, I think that is exactly where we're going to go. I think ultimately we have to get to some sort of um, uh, almost international common law amongst this stuff, and, and perhaps Gary can answer this a little better from being a lawyer, but from, uh, I've consulted with the European Union a bit, as well as a lot of others at my company, and they're trying to at least unify, for example, cybercrime laws in, in the European Union, so that it's much easier to prosecute someone in Romania who tapped somebody in the United Kingdom, and, and have some sort of a, a basis for what a, 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 an online crime is. And, and how extradition might work and all these types of things. And in these individual cases, you can prove because you go through the legal process the same as you would any other crime. If, if there's enough circumstantial evidence to suggest you've identified the perpetrator, you go to a court, you get a warrant, and you confiscate the evidence, and you do the forensic work to prove whether or not that person was involved in the crime. Um, when it's a nation state, it's a whole different kettle of fish, though. Um, yeah. Chester, that... if I can weigh in here, even though the question came from a Cal student, though I did my work at graduate work at Stanford, <laughs> I'll, that's an inside joke. <laughs> Cal and Stanford have kind of done, but uh, I can't resist a comment because um, when President Park Geun Hye met with President Obama earlier this year, they announced that beginning this year, there would be annual vice ministerial consultations between the two countries, annually, on, with, on ICT sector, telecommunications policy and ICT sector policy issues. Uh, I believe one of these areas is in fact 
crime generally, but also cybercrime, because the number of uh, Koreans who live in the United States as American citizens and travel back and forth and the various forms of exchange. So I would hope that one of the, first of all, that the relationship between Korea and the United States would broaden significantly beyond the military strategic into all of these areas. And that may be a, a counterpoint to the example of the US attempting to talk with Russia. Russia may say, oh, we don't want to talk to you, but it may well be that the Republic of Korea and uh, the United States have a lot more common ground. Uh, can I have yes. a call? Okay. Um, is there any kind of effort going on to form an international legislation or regarding the cybercrime at all? Or? Not that I'm aware of other than, like I say, I, I know the European Union has been battling over uh, tightening up their, their uh, policies and unifying things across the EU, but I haven't, I'm not aware of any, aside from things like, no, it depends also on the type of crime, right? Like, we do a lot of investigation of, of child abuse imagery online that we, you know, accidentally stumble into in our line of work doing security work, and there are international organizations already for prosecuting and cooperating for that type of crime for child abuse. Um, so there's some specific areas where there already is existing you know, existing cooperation that's now cyber is just being thrown in with it. Uh, but you, you have comments, Gary? Yeah, I think uh, Chester's answer previously was really on the money. I think for most of these um, crimes, the nation state's empowered to act and can act, especially at the individual level. Um, but there are international agencies, um, they're not making legislation, but something like the International Court, Criminal Court, might be available into the future. It normally deals with kind of genocide at the moment. They're the sorts of issues it's dealing with in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia. Um, but maybe they could deal with something like these international kind of uh, interventions by nation states or others. The only trouble is uh, the jurisdiction of the court and whether it can do anything, but also do you want that um, court to be dealing with things like American um, sabotage of the Iranian nuclear power industry. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, I, I don't know. Yeah, and that's, that's why the United States, it's actually the United States that's refusing to enter into any kind of a UN agreement because the, I think they, 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 they want to continue their clandestine operations without having ever uh, broke international law. Uh, thank next. you. Okay, thank you. Yes, up there, next question. Stand up, please, so that we can get the mic to you. And, uh, and then, uh, if there are other people with questions, raise your hand. There's a question down here, all the way down here. Yeah. Okay, please. Um, my name is Benny, and I'm currently studying in China. Um, I know the panels are experts in their own areas, and they, I am aware that they need to stay as objective as possible. But I just wanted some honest um, responses, a personal response on the question of whether negative repercussions on new technology are inevitable or inevitable. Because personally, I think the world's messed up. <laughs> and negative responses from new technology is inevitable. So I just wanted to hear some personal opinions from the experts. Can I ask you to clarify what you mean by negative responses of new, do you mean uh, negative side effects, yes. un unintended side effects? Yes. Maybe I could try to pinpoint and answer that in the nuclear case. Does any of you from Japan, Japanese students here today? Raise your hand. Japan? Oh, okay, uh, okay. You know what, today is the 7th of August. In Japan is what? What day is it today? Special day. Hiroshima Day, right? The first nuclear bomb ever was dropped in Hiroshima 6th yesterday. Yeah, close enough. And it was 68 years ago today, or yesterday, the first nuclear bomb was dropped. And the good positive side of this was to end the Second World War. Yeah, and, and it prevented I don't know how many umpteen uh, millions of more uh, casualties to complete the war. Instead, only the, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, several hundred thousand people died. All right. 
However, the, the back side, the negative side, of course, is created the huge negative legacy of dark side of nuclear being uh, associated with the bomb. Bomb is, uh, is the most evil thing, right? So, so the technology in that case created such a huge negative impact. Uh, and people forgot about uh, what good it did uh, in terms of uh, finishing up the war and saving other possible millions of uh, deaths that it prevented. All right, so that, that's uh, one case that comes to my mind. So that uh, that's probably the most public opposition against nuclear power today. It, it stems from this original sin, I, I, I call it, that uh, because the birth of nuclear technology is from the bomb. Yeah, so it created such a dark image. Yeah, although today we we, we are suffering from that. I um I don't think you can um, talk in kind of totalizing or general terms. I think you have to kind of consider all technologies or groups of technologies in their own terms. And there's no doubt that most technologies, perhaps all technologies, have adverse consequences and risks, and maybe to some extent are iatrogenic. But um, what do you do with something like uh, a vaccine? You know, if you have, even if you had one in a thousand, one in a million people get injured by taking the vaccine, how do you weigh up the kind of the massive benefits to society that you get from the vaccine? And this goes across a range of things. Yes, there might be with some other kind of uh, medical interventions. There's always risks. The use of anaesthetic has a risk, but it has an undoubted benefit. And so it's not all negative. A lot of it's very, very good, very useful, and we need to take that into account in a balanced way, but in relation to the individual um, technologies. That's what I'd say in relation to that. I'd probably disagree a little bit with BK in relation to the, the, the end of the war, though. I think there's a, there are kind of major differences in the interpretation there where um, the Americans wanted to precipitously end the war. Not uh, Japan was ready for total surrender before the bombs were dropped. And the Americans did this to prevent the Russians coming in and assuming land at the end. They finished the war with the Germans and were coming out to the east. So maybe there's different ways of understanding that as well. well I, I guess it's hard to uh, put a value on the positive and the negative of any one of these technologies. I mean, that's really the challenge a lot, right? Like I, uh, I get asked a lot of questions about things like uh, Tor, you know, the, the dark net, the, the secret internet that, you know, while I only get asked about child pornographers and drug dealers and stuff using this secret network to trade things online, for every case of that that I've ever heard of, I've talked to a journalist who's been able to file a story from a country where they would be imprisoned for telling a story and we're able to secretly communicate to the world knowledge that we all needed to know. And so I don't know that, I don't know how you place a value on the bad way somebody used guns versus the good way, or the bad way we've used our anonymity versus a positive way. And I think all of us can agree that we're better off than our grandparents were in our lives today, and they were better off than their grandparents. And so I think technology is serving us well on the whole. Yeah, and I think it's the human beings. We still have not reached the point, even with all these wonderful networks and digitization and global level effects of technologies, human beings still are kind of in the driver's seat. So my personal take on it, which I, I'm not gonna go on and offer evidence or say anything further, but I think it's human sort of failures and it's gonna require effort to deal with these challenges that we face uh, in the future. And unfortunately, we've run out of time to take any more questions. I know there were a number of more questions, but uh, perhaps you could catch us uh, after the session or during the conference. Thanks very much for your active involvement. Uh, so really in the afternoon. Thank you very much for the panelists, and it was a fantastic opportunity to think more about how a science and society should form harmony for the balance of society. Please give a big applause for our panelists once again.